Good morning and welcome to the Law and Crime Network, everybody. This is Jesse Weber. I'm joined by my co-host, Stephanie Willis. And we have a very, very big day for you today, and we don't want to waste any time. We covered the Adam Matos case in the past two weeks. We saw the verdict yesterday by the jury. They recommended a life sentence without the possibility of parole, and Judge Mary Hansel laid down that sentence in brutal fashion to Adam Matos yesterday. But right now, right now, we're so lucky because we have with us right now the prosecutors in the Adam Matos case, Brian Sarabia and Chris Labruzzo. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here today on the Law and Crime Network. Good morning. Our pleasure. Good morning. So let's, I want to start really just by first saying you guys put on a terrific case. It was presented so well, really poignant arguments. We're going to talk about that. But my very first question is, you were able to secure four murder convictions uh, for first degree murder in this case, but you were not able to get the jury to sentence Mr. Matos to death. W are you disappointed at all by what happened yesterday? Well, we respect the jury's decision, both as to the guilt phase and as to the penalty phase. Uh, as you said, we put forth our best you know, case that we could to try to secure the death penalty. Uh, it was a, a lot of effort. So in that respect, uh, we are slightly disappointed, but uh, we do respect their decision. And we understand that it's a, you know, it's a big ask to ask you know, to put someone to death. And you know, I thought this case, we think this case deserved it. And that's why we sought it and put forth you know, all the evidence that we did. And it's, a, it's a little disappointing that one juror can derail that process, and um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the state of affairs of Florida, but it, it is a fairly new way that they're doing things. Uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago, had we tried this case, it would have only been a majority, but uh, as we sit here today, that, that is the state of the law, and we respect that that's the way it came out. Right. It was one juror that held out on the Margaret Brown um, that that part of the case and really it was one juror so it's really tough i imagine to really get a a unanimous jury uh now it is under florida law just so you can give our, our viewers a little bit of an idea what was it like to prosecute this case we were watching it every day but from an insider's perspective what was it like well there there's a case that uh, arose out of our circuit a few years ago it's the hodgkins case which basically makes a circumstantial death penalty uh, first degree premeditated murder case uh, extremely difficult and so with that in mind that case in mind we spent a lot of time tying up all the circumstantial evidence that we could we listed a number of witnesses uh, well over 300 almost 400 witnesses we you know tried to break down every circumstance every fact that we could that would you know point to mr matto so in as far as prosecuting it it was a very difficult case because you want to put forth all the evidence that you can all the circumstantial evidence uh it was also a very gut-wrenching process in this case we spent a, a lot of time with the family members the browns the thomases we traveled all over the united states uh, interviewing witnesses so we, you know we really invested you know not only our, all our mental power but our emotional power and a, a lot of time to try to make sure that we could present that case uh, the way we did. And absolutely, I, you know, we have to commend you. We were both, Jesse and I, while we were covering this trial, uh, we both said what a, a phenomenal job the prosecution was, uh, was doing in presenting this case. Uh, we found that during your case in chief, however, the defense was very particular in the individuals that they chose to cross-examine. As a matter of fact, they, they failed to cross-examine quite a few of the witnesses that you presented. Uh, did you find that this was odd at the time, or were you aware that pretty much at that time they were simply trying to save his life? Well, initially we thought it was odd, uh, but you know, every day we'd come back and sit at the table and kind of round table what the day's events had laid out. We, so we initially thought it was odd, but you have to know, and I'm sure you guys do, in, in the state of Florida we have open discovery, the uh, witnesses have been deposed. There have been recorded police statements. Uh, these witnesses testified consistently throughout th this case, even though it's been three years. So we, even though they chose not to cross-examine them, we knew in calling the, the vast majority of these witnesses that there really wasn't going to be areas where they were going to be able to catch witnesses in inconsistent statements or statements that were inconsistent with other physical evidence in this case. So we weren't terribly surprised in fact we you know uh, informed a number of our witnesses that there really weren't going to be areas that the defense could uh you know attack them so 
there were some witnesses that we thought they would have maybe gone after more, and that in the fact that they didn't was probably uh, more illuminating as to what their strategy was going to be. But on the whole, I, I we didn't expect a lot of cross examination to a lot of our witnesses. Yeah, for instance, like the pizza people, the Craigslist people, they, there just wasn't a lot to to call into question with their testimony. It was all pretty straightforward. What's interesting is that we were shocked standing here. We're outside perspective watching. When we heard the defense put on their self-defense argument and then put Adam Matos on the stand, I think my jaw must have dropped. I, I didn't expect this. I didn't know which way they were going. When you heard um, the defense attorney in this case go and present that opening argument in for the self-defense claim and then agree to put Adam Matos on the stand, what were you thinking, guys? Well, uh, we knew that if they were going to go a route other than it wasn't him, he wasn't there, that it was going to be hard to do that without calling him to the stand because he'd already precluded that with previous statements. Uh, once the defense gave their opening, it was very clear to us that the defendant was going to have to testify in order for any of those facts to be, to be presented. Um, it was not the way that we would have expected him to testify, but um, we thought uh, that that we felt very confident that he was not going to be able to, that, he, that that wasn't going to work for him. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that story was just not borne out by the evidence, not borne out by his actions, and we didn't feel like he would be able to sell it. Uh, we spent a fair amount of time discussing his testimony. Uh, we, you know, in all cases, you, you, you have to be aware of whether or not he's going to testify. In this case, I think we spent a lot of time thinking about what he would testify about. So. We weren't terribly surprised when he decided to testify. The substance of his testimony was more shocking than anything, primarily because the, the way he laid it out, that self-defense doesn't really apply. Uh, and we just thought if it was going to be a self-defense argument, it was going to be a little bit different than he, than he laid out. Yeah, and speaking of that uh, argument, uh, Mr. Sribi, you had the chance to cross-examine him, and we followed that minute by minute. It was really quite the cross-examination. What was that like to cross-examine the defendant in this case? Well, thank you. Um, I, I tell you, one of the challenges of, in a situation like that is after he testified, you almost want to say, Judge, I don't have any questions. That was the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. <laughs> you know, where, where, do you, where do you begin to attack a story that doesn't even make a whole lot of sense when he starts it? But um, it was... It was a great opportunity, you know, I thank Mr. Labruzzo and Mr. McCabe and Mr. Bartlett for all uh, putting me in a position where I was able to do that. Um, but it was it was a good experience to be able to challenge him on just some of the, the, the baloney he was putting out there. And um, you try and stick to pointing out through him all the actions that he did that either disprove what he's saying or call severely into question what he's saying or just are inconsistent in and of themselves. So. Um, and as a former prosecutor myself, I can count on one hand how many times um, I have been able to cross-examine uh, a defendant. So how were you all able to come to the decision as to uh, Mr. Sarabia being the one who, uh, who cross-examined him? Well, we really uh, arm wrestled over it. No, I'm just kidding. We we spent a fair amount of time discussing our strategy as to that, and yeah, and everyone had a part in how we were going to go about doing that, regardless of who did it. Um, especially me and Mr. Labruzzo, we spent a lot of time discussing different areas that we would want to address. And it came down to, in my opinion, that you know, Brian here has been on this case since the day that it happened. He went out to the crime scene. He knew this case better than anyone, and if you're going to be up there questioning a defendant you want to have your full arsenal of information up there and in our opinion he had the best knowledge of the case as to the ins and outs and if mr uh, matos was going to say something that just was uh, unbelievable like he did that you want to be able to point out all the pieces of evidence that um that are out there and not be overcome by the the magnitude of really what's going on yeah, this case had dramatics in it. I mean, it was full of drama. And one of the big aspects of the drama was yesterday with the victim impact statements. Particularly, I want to just play a quick clip of Mr. Uh, Jim Thomas, who provided a victim impact statement. And as we were watching, it appeared it appeared he was walking over to Adam Matos's table. I want to play that clip real quick, yeah, and then we'll get your if thoughts. If I can, um, he, was actually, he actually walked over to Willie Pira, the defense attorney. Uh, uh, so 
I, I'm not sure if that was obvious from TV, but he did not approach Mr. Matos, who was sitting a couple seats down. He actually approached uh, Mr. Pira. Well, let, let's play that clip, and it, either way, it provided some definitely some dramatic moments in this case, and then we'll get your thoughts on the rest of yesterday and this case as well. Over the top at that one point, but my emotions are over the top. <laughs> I would like to say just a few words. My daughter Elizabeth has a young son about the age of Tristan. She had to stop him visiting Tristan because Tristan full well knows what happened on that fateful day. And he continually repeats, my daddy killed my mommy. It was too bad he couldn't testify to the jury to that fact, but he's autistic and you don't know what impact it would really have on him. But he wishes, because he knows enough about Florida, that an alligator would eat Mr. Matos. I can't say much more other than a little boy who has problems had a whole lot more dumped on him by that. And welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. What you just saw was the victim impact statement from Jim Thomas, and we are still here with the prosecutors who recently attained a, a guilty conviction in all for all four victims in the Adam Matos case. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> and um, so we were just watching the victim impact statement from uh, Mr. Mr. Jim Thomas. And at the time, you, you were explaining to us exactly what was happening. Would you mind go, um, explaining to us a little bit what was going through your minds as you saw him approaching the defense table? Um, we, it, it, it was not, you know, Mr. Pira, however we may feel or anyone may feel about his arguments, appropriate or otherwise, it, it was not an appropriate thing to do. Mr. Pure is doing his job. Um, and it, Mr. Thomas is obviously very upset right. and he, he has a right to be. He, he's been through a lot through this whole thing. He's been to several of the court appearances. And you know, I, I, I don't even wanna to begin to imagine how this event has, uh, has, has, has weighed on him. I mean, just dealing with him through from the beginning to now he has aged significantly uh through this process i mean you could tell that uh since since the murders he it has affected his health uh in a negative manner but um you know it, it, we just wanted to to tell you know the time and place for that type of thing is not there in the courtroom and that to 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 move it along and you know mr pira again that it's not the time and place to to deal with him about it. You know, right. if he wants to write him a letter, that's one thing. But um, so we we were just trying to make sure everybody everybody was behaving as best we could. And uh, prior to uh, the reading of the 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 jury's decision, did you have the opportunity to speak with the families prior to the jury uh, bringing their decision here in this case? Well, yeah, many times. Yeah. So you know the the. The prosecutor's role behind the scenes, we're not in the courtroom. You know, we, we do spend uh, a fair amount of time speaking with family members, explaining to them the, the law of what, what could occur, what might occur. Uh, so we did spend a fair amount of time speaking with them, you know, and encourage them to prepare written statements as, as they all did, those that spoke. Uh, you know, that, that is one of the, the roles of the prosecutor that, you know, you really don't learn in law school is how to, you know, deal with uh, the family members of, of crimes. And you know, in this case, it it's took a number of years to get to the verdict. We spent uh, a lot of time speaking with family members, you know, just making sure that they understood every step of the process, uh, so that they felt informed, so that they understood what was going on. So yeah, we, we spent a fair amount of time speaking with them, and you know, I, I know that in the end they appreciated it. But it, it is also you know part of the case that you guys don't get to see that we you know we spent a lot of time doing. Yeah, and it, we we have prepared them all that under the current law in florida that the death penalty was a very uh it, it was an outside possibility it, it was an uphill charge for us to get 12 people to agree on something like that so i i think that they their expectations were um were appropriate that they they 
it wasn't going to be a huge shock to them if it ended up the way that it did. Well, gentlemen, I have to tell you, I was watching the penalty phase, and I thought you put on some great arguments about that this, the heinous nature of this crime, but then the fact that this was four killings at the same time, which is a really a strong, aggravating factor. But really, you tore apart, Mr. Sarabia, in the, your um, closing arguments, the mitigating factors that were put forward by the defense. Everything from Adam Matos' upbringing to, you know, the fact that he uh, loved Tristan more than anything in the world when the evidence might have not said that, when it showed that he was in the house during the time of the murders. What was your thought process really tackling into these mitigating factors? What did you think of them, the, the ones that were put forward by the defense? Well, in, in terms of mitigating factors that we see in cases like these, these were really, really weak. I mean, um, sometimes you see mental health mitigation. I mean, I, I, I'm sure you guys are familiar with James Holmes out of Colorado. I mean, that, whatever you think about the crime, there was at least some sort of uh, mental defects in play that, that may mitigate or may um, convince the jury, but there was none of that here. Mr. Matos is, is, for all intents and purposes, a normal, fairly intelligent human being. Um, he may be a narcissistic sociopath, but uh, he is... He doesn't have any of those things. There's no particular aspect of his upbringing that is is wildly different from other people that would say he was on this path and he had no chance in life. Um, and you know, I, I I think that the jury understood that because they clearly got all the way to the point of you know past the weighing of the mitigators and the aggravators. So we we all agree that the aggravators outweigh the mitigators here. Um, so. Yeah, it was some of them, a lot, and you could tell he, Adam Matos was attempting to set this up during his testimony. Uh, he kept throwing Tristan in to his responses in different areas where Tristan didn't belong uh, or that were clearly not true. So um, there, it, I mean, it was actually fairly cowardly for him to try and hide behind his son in that regard, and it allowed us to make the arguments we wouldn't have otherwise been able to make about like, no, look at how Tristan was treated throughout this. Because uh, as you guys know, it wouldn't be an aggravator that Tristan was present or that Tristan uh, was left alone in the house with, with that awful smell. Uh, but because they put it forth as a mitigator, we could at least argue against it and, uh, and lay that out for the jury. Yeah, I think that was a big factor. I think that really resonated in the minds of the jurors when you presented that idea that, you know, he was present during all of this. And it wasn't that Mr. Matos, Tristan, was the most important thing in his world. It was you, Mr. Matos. You treated yourself as the most important person in the world. You were selfish. And, guys, it's not only you who made this argument. It was the judge in this case when she laid down her sentence as well. And I believe she was reiterating some of the language that you put in in your uh, closing arguments. I want to play briefly the... Um, uh, Judge Mary Hansel's sentence of Adam Matos when she really laid down the hammer against him and then I would like your thoughts about uh, what she had to say. So let's play this now for our viewers. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can't control your emotions, uh, everyone's had an opportunity to speak, you can step out, okay? We just need to finish up this for today. Um, Mr. Matos, um, before we proceed with the sentence, I have a few things to say. We all know what your sentence is going to be. It was decided by the jury. It was decided by one vote, and Mr. Pure made sure of that. He asked the jury if any one of them would spare your life, that they do so, and they did. The last person who they chose, Margaret Brown's case, the vote in your case was 11 to 1. That means one person on that jury felt enough sympathy, mercy for you that they decided that you did not deserve the death penalty. So for that, I don't have to make that decision. It's not something that I ever wanted to do or wished to do. But if there was ever a case that I've ever heard that 12 people would have decided that death was appropriate, this is probably it, but that's their decision. I believe wholeheartedly in the judicial system, and I believe that those 12 people made up their mind, and that sentence will be imposed on you. But I also agree with the victims in this case. This was the most selfish, 
self-centered, evil thing that I've ever heard. That you took the stand and you said that you did all this for your son is ridiculous. Your son was in the house when this occurred. He was either in the room or within 65, 70 feet of when you shot his mother, shot his grandfather, and then waited five hours by your own admission to walk downstairs and beat his grandmother to death. In those five hours, you must have sat in that house with your son. He was there. It's six o'clock in the evening. He's not asleep. He's not locked in his room. You're sitting there with your son, with his dead mother, his dead grandfather, and a man who gave his life for those people. You sat there with him and went downstairs and finished off his grandmother. And you did that for your own selfish reasons. Maybe it was your age. Maybe it was that you felt that they had done something to you that you needed to get revenge for. But there was no remorse. Just saying you're sorry doesn't make it so. <coughs> You're not sorry for what you did yet. Maybe someday you will be. You weren't sorry that day. You weren't sorry when you took the stand and you're not sorry now. Your son will grow up without a mother and without grandparents and without a father, just as you did. But worse than you, he will grow up without a father because he will know that his father murdered his mother and murdered his grandparents. There's no worse life than that. Hopefully, with the love that he has from the Piles and the Browns and all the other family relatives that he has, he will learn to understand and be happy and learn the things about his mother that he did not know because he took her at such a young age of his. There's nothing worse than losing a parent at a young age, but to have them taken from you by your father, I can't imagine. So hopefully, some way, somehow, through the love of the family that he has here, he will grow up to be a healthy, happy, productive, hardworking, loving person. But that's not because of you. So to say that Tristan is your whole world, I don't believe that. I don't believe Tristan was your whole world. I believe that you did this because you were selfish. And based on the decision of the jury, I sent it to you in count one and count four to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In counts two and three, I sent it to you to life without the possibility of parole. However, that's with a firearm, discharge, include charging debt, which means hopefully that no matter what happens with the legislature, no matter what we decide, on life or death in your case, you will never, ever be released from prison. Can you afford to hire an attorney for your appeal? No, no, Your Honor. All right, so at this point, I will appoint the public defender to represent you for, for appeal. State, is there any um, costs associated that you're asking me to impose? Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network, everybody. We are joined today by the attorneys, the prosecuting attorneys in the Adam Matos case, Brian Sarabia and Chris Labruzzo. Gentlemen, you just heard Judge Mary Hansel deliver that sentence to Adam Matos in, uh, she didn't, she didn't mince any words and used uh, some of the language that you had used, Mr. Sarabia, in your closing arguments. What did you think of her sentence? And just in general, what did you think of uh, uh, presiding, at, you know, handling over a case in front of this judge? Uh, as her sentence, I would prefer their sentence to be death, but uh, given given the uh, legal uh, pro uh, implications of the jury's verdict, uh, in terms of when she was sentencing the defendant, um, I, I had the opportunity and pleasure of working with Judge Hansel when she was a prosecutor. She's very sharp. She's perceptive. Um, she brings that to the bench as well. I think both Mr. Buzo and I have had the opportunity to do several trials in front of her. Um, so. You know, she, she, again, she is perceptive. She, she can see through this defendant's lies. She understands what's going on here. And um, she 
felt it appropriate, and I think it was appropriate to let him know that he is he. It the result that we got is not because he fooled anybody. Um, that people are very clear that who he is is not who he wants to be portrayed as being, and uh, I think it, it was good for the families, and I think it was appropriate. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's uh, you know. She spoke for all of us that you know yesterday, uh, and it was good. You know, it's good to have that closure uh, as he sentenced and walks out the door, not to be seen again. Uh, it, it, you know, it kind of just resonates, with, like Brian said, with the victim's family. They they have that level of closure. They get that. They feel that you know, like Brian said, he didn't feel fool anyone, and it, it is and it's kind of done for him. You know, and as far as you know, trying cases in front of Judge Hansel, you know it. It is a pleasure to try cases in front of a judge that has a firm grasp of the rules of evidence and allows us to do the things that the law allows. And so, uh, from that perspective, you know, we enjoy trying cases in front of her. We, you know, we only have two criminal judges up here, and it's a pleasure to have the uh, opportunity to try cases like that in front of her. It has to be said that we, we all, well, most of us here at the Law and Crime Network, we thought that she did a great job in moving the case forward and that she was very fair uh, during, during, throughout the trial. Uh, one thing I wanted to discuss with you all, though, is the fact that during, uh, during the time in which Judge Hansel was speaking with Adam Matos, in addition to the time uh, during your closing arguments, you, you both concentrated on uh, Tristan and the fact that Tristan was not in was not his world as he uh, stated during his uh, direct examination and solely because of the fact that he was left in the house with the dead bodies or because as just Hans Hansel stated the fact that Adam Matos was selfish was there any particular reason why um, child endangerment charges were not brought in this case well well, when you, when you indict someone on four counts of murder in the first degree with the mind that you're going to, uh, you know, seek the death penalty, uh, a child endangerment charge really doesn't... Um, doesn't add anything. Doesn't add, uh, it's, it, it's not a violent crime, so it wouldn't be an aggravator. Um, and quite, quite frankly, when the indictment came out, I don't know that we had all the different surveillance videos yet to show all the different periods and knew exactly where Tristan was. Um, and, and then as another note, you know, as I kind of mentioned earlier, Brian and I have traveled all over on this case. We both went and met with Tristan on two separate occasions. We spoke with him, uh, and we, you know, have a good understanding of what kind of, uh, you know, what a beautiful young boy he is. And, you know, really to put him through a trial, uh, whether or not we'd have to call him or not would be, a, you know, a legal question we'd have to determine. But from the outset, you really don't want to put that kid through anything else because, you know, it's just like the family member said, when we met with him, he would tell us things about what he saw, what he heard, and what he knows, and your heart just, you know, bleeds for this kid, and you really don't want to put him through any more, or even give an opportunity for him to be in a courtroom with Mr. Matos, either for the benefit of, you know, the harm to Tristan or the benefit to Mr. Matos. Uh, he didn't, Mr. Matos doesn't deserve to see his son anymore and will never get a chance to. Uh, and you really just didn't want to put that, you know, Tristan through that because it, it would be, it could have been more detrimental than any level of benefit that we would have gotten out of it. Yeah, one of the reasons we we did focus on it when we had the opportunities is uh, having conversations with Tristan. We both know that Tristan was present when his mother was was killed. Uh, it is very it has been very clear in talking to him that he was there for that, uh, despite what Mr. Matos wants people to believe. Yeah, it's just absolutely horrifying and to think about that this young boy is going to grow up without a mother, he's going to grow up without grandparents, and he's going to be growing up without a father due to the father's own actions, as, as Judge Hansel said. Um, it's really, really sad to hear. Um, there is a question that is being brought up by a lot of our viewers, and they, they, it's about strategy. It's about the death penalty phase of this case. We saw that the, you brought out two witnesses you, um, during the penalty phase. You brought out Dr. Noel Palma and you brought out Jimmy Sigler, but there were no victim impact statements brought out before the jury went to deliberate. And I know right. that the Supreme Court has kind of gone back and forth about this issue, and it might be different in Florida, but maybe you could explain to our viewers why the victim impact sure. statements were brought afterwards. Sure. So um, it was a strategic decision on our part. We did talk about it. Uh, the law does allow for victim impact in front of a jury, but there is an 
instruction uh, that the jury would hear that although they heard victim impact testimony, they are not to consider that an aggravator. And just from our standpoint, we felt very uh, comfortable with the two aggravators that we had and didn't want to create an appellate issue. Uh, so that we made that strategic decision to not place that in front of the jury. Uh, it's, a, it's a decision that I'd stand by because if ultimately we were successful in getting a death uh, sentence in this case, this case automatically gets appealed to the Florida Supreme Court and, and they are known to nitpick and, and, and find things that they don't like and change law uh, in these types of cases. And that's just not something that we were willing to do in this case. We've we I mean, quite candidly, throughout this entire case, we were not only thinking about how are we going to prove this case to the jury, but also how are we going to put forth a case that's going to stand the test of time through appellate review. Uh, so we made a lot of strategic decisions about not only well, what is the jury going to think, but what is an appellate court going to think, uh, more so than some other cases, because we really were trying to build a, a case that would stand the test of time. Yeah, and no, nobody wants to see this case tried a second time. Um, and also, in terms of the victim impact statements, based on the aggravators and based on some of the testimonies that came out, uh, I don't think that that would have swayed the one juror. I don't think that that would have made the difference that would have resulted in a different result. Uh, you know, we, we understand that there are numerous tactical approaches when we are conducting as attorneys cross-examination. In the case of Mrs. Uh, Matos, uh, we know that you had to get certain points across uh, from her, but in a sense you had to kind of do it in a respectful manner. What was your approach? How did you, what, what was your tactical approach in getting out the points that you needed to during her cross-examination? Well, I just tried to focus on uh, the, the things that she testified about. I tried to draw a comparison between Adam and her other son, Peter. Uh, you know, I, I only asked the question about what they thought of the case if they were soliciting some sort of opinion as to uh, uh, Adam Matos as a, as a good father. Uh, so I tried to be respectful. I tried to be, uh, you know, as direct as I could with her. She was slightly evasive in some of her answers. And so I, I wasn't going to, uh, you know, fight her on her answers. I just wanted to make sure that her answers were clear and that we had an understanding of what they were. Uh, I, I would have, in, uh, on other witnesses, as you obviously got to see, there were some witnesses that we felt like we could push a lot harder and would get more direct answers from, and that's where we pushed. And also, you know, we were trying to walk a fine line of not being uh, abusive of, of his mother. His mother didn't deserve to be put in this position either. And so, you know, we just wanted to, you know, call into question what little she could testify about. Right. Yeah, and, and, and we're fully cognizant of the fact that his mother is not the one who killed four people. His brother is not the one right. who killed four people. And in a sense that Mr. Matos has put them through this, too. Mm -hmm. so. I absolutely. I absolutely agree with you in that case. Now, upon uh, reading of the jury's decision uh, to not proceed forward uh, with with death, um, we found that, or I found that, as they were, as the the decision was being read, we found that they found that you had proved beyond a reasonable doubt most of the steps, or all four of the phases that you explained to them um, during your opening during the the death penalty phase. Were you at all surprised at the fact that they c all could not come to a un unanimous decision as not to at death? All. Okay. Yeah. No, we weren't really surprised. That, that is kind of the way that we expected it to go. Right. We we. Uh, we thought that we were going to get all the way to the last step and that the last step was going to be you know, either one juror or maybe two jurors, which is exactly the way it happened, um, who, uh, who went the other way. And I would note that both under the interim death penalty scheme and the previous death penalty scheme, we'd be looking at a death penalty sentence right now, or at least the judge would have the option of that. But yeah. Yeah, they're, as it stood now, we, we, we kind of anticipated that this was the likely result. There, we know that in some states, a judge can actually take a recommendation uh, by a jury of a, of a life sentence, but they can actually flip it and impose a death sentence if there's at least one aggravating factor. I know the Supreme Court reviews, review, refused excuse me, to take a, a case from Alabama on this issue, but right. do you, do, what do you think about that under Florida law that the jury has the final say? I know we respect the jury's decision, but having said well, that, this, it, what do you it, think? It's brand new. I, that used to be the way it was in Florida. Again, when this case was pending, um, part of the reason it, it was scheduled for trial back in February of this year, and it got delayed because of this, this confusion in the death penalty statute. Back then, the judge could have overridden a, uh, a jury recommendation, uh, and the Supreme Court, for other reasons, uh, knocked, the United States Supreme Court knocked down 
the Florida death penalty statute, but then the Florida Supreme Court took it a couple steps further and put the legislature in a position where they had to make it a unanimous uh, jury vote on these specific four questions. So I don't think there's anything wrong with unanimity. It just definitely makes it a lot more difficult. Um, and you know, if you're, it just. It's just one of those things that you know, if you're going to impose that severe of a penalty, uh, it should uh, it should be unanimous. But you know, when you see it in the practicality of it, when there are people that deserve it, and if you believe in the death penalty, then you know it's a shame that you can't get there on cases like this. I do think that it should be a situation where it should be unanimous either way. Meaning, if if you have a holdout like this, then uh, then you do it again like a hung jury or a mistrial in a in a in a verdict. But that's just my personal opinion. Well, we keep talking about the jury uh, in this case, and I'm curious about whether it was tough to find a jury in this case, because as we know from us, we know this. Is it not true that at least one juror found Mr. Matos to be too good looking that they couldn't be objective in this case? Was it, what did you think of that and finding a jury for this case in general? The, that juror said a number of other things. It was clear she was just trying to say things to, to not be a part of the process. Um, I, I noticed that that made the news and that that was uh, one of the things yeah. that were... It's were a hard ask. About, to, but to, she, she also mentioned, I think that the, the next day we came back, she said she just started reading the Bible that night with her boyfriend and that she couldn't do it for that. So um, I think that that was just a, yeah. an attempt to a, avoid being on the jury. It, it's difficult to ask members of the community to come in and give that much time uh, to these issues. And you listen, we're eternally grateful for that because without jurors, we would you guys wouldn't have a ch channel. We wouldn't have a job. Right. Uh, you know, I, I think that we're we're very grateful for the people that do that uh, and give so of their time and their efforts. Uh, it's a shame that some people would not give of their time. There were a lot of people who just you know wouldn't do it. Uh, we're, we're appreciative and you know thankful for that not only jurors in a whole but this juror in particular that gave their time to, to listen to the facts of this case yeah I would add though it is a consideration when you have an attractive defendant male or female um, that could be that can be a factor in a jury's decision if somebody comes off as more charismatic regardless of how terrible a murderer they are it may influence a juror one way or the other so it is something that we are aware of and it is something we try to to protect against. Jurors are human beings, and speaking of almost being a human being, um, Adam Matos yesterday provided a statement to all the family members saying he apologizes and don't hold hate in your heart. Guys, what did you think of that statement? Well, um, the sad part about it is is he, he is not wrong in his words, but it was, it was not sincere. I mean, I, I was there. He was clearly not sincere, and he was almost taunting the victim's family. Uh, he was it, it was, it was disrespectful, and certainly any message like that, because forgiveness is important for all parties, and it, it, it can eat at people, uh, even when they're dealing with something as horrendous as this. But Mr. Matos has no right to be making those statements. He has, he has lost any right he has. He might have had to to send a message like that and yeah. it was it was disrespectful and I, I think it is in line with his character as we've come to know it through prosecuting the case and I'm sure you guys have had pictures of in in viewing the case that um, yeah he even he taunted law enforcement when he was giving those interviews it's kind of hard to tell on the video but when they're asking him like hey can Tristan go with Megan can Tristan go with his grandparents He's taunting them with, oh, yeah, you should call them. You, you know, I wouldn't yeah. know. Go, go ahead, call them up. Knowing full well that law enforcement were at, at, was at that house, could tell that there were, were going to be dead people, and that the phones of the grandparents were there in the house. So, um, yeah, I, again, it just... They were empty words. That's the only way. I, it, it almost just went right over me because they were so empty in the way he delivered them and the way that he felt them, and it, it just... It had no effect on me because it just felt so empty. Well, that's one of the biggest criticisms that people made of him testifying that he was an emotionless and robotic. Did you feel the same way? Absolutely. I mean, the, he shows no emotion, no, no remorse, no remorse, and, and no soul, and all the things because you know we obviously have an opportunity to listen to and hear his conversations from the jail, from his letters that are written. We we, we examine everything. He is absent of that, and so it was not shocking to at all. To the extent that he is sorry for these, he is sorry for himself, and mm -hmm. and that is that is where it ends. Um, it is he, you know, 
unfortunately, he is a poster child for somebody that deserves the death penalty, but, but here we are. Well, gentlemen, I know we have to let you go, but I do want both of you to provide just your final thoughts as you decompress from this case. Congratulations on securing four uh, uh, murder convictions against this defendant. He will be facing the rest of his life in prison. Um, but as you decompress, as you reflect on this case, what are both of your final thoughts as you move on from this case? Well, I think that the final thought that I have is that anything is possible. Uh, you know, it's often said in trial work that even when you feel like you're 100% ready, you're only 80% ready. And there were just some things that we just did not anticipate from the get-go. And so as we go forward with cases, you have to get better at anticipating all the things that, that can happen. And so as I walk away from it, I, I, I feel that, uh, you know, you have to be, have to anticipate everything and as we go forward. And, you know, I, I feel that the family also feels, uh, you know, has some closure in this case. You know, we have some closure and hopefully they walk away feeling they have some closure in it because they've been very supportive of us during this process. And, you know, it, it, it also takes a village in trying a case. There was a huge team effort in our office and with our team to get this case together. So we're, you know, you come together as a team to do cases like this and you come together as a community. So I, I really feel that that's a, a strong takeaway that we do have a strong community and we do have a, a good team here at the state attorney's office. And so from those are the things that I kind of walk away feeling good about. And uh, my heart goes out to the victims' families. I, I think that I am glad that the way that we, they went to trial and it played out the way it did, because I think that it allowed them hopefully to get more closure, you know, to see Mr. Matos on the stand and at least gives some semblance of a, of a, of a recounting of what happened, although I, I have strong reservations about the truth of many of his statements. But um, I, I'm hoping that it will help them heal as much as possible given the circumstances. And, um, and I am thankful for all the support they were uh, throughout this process. And also many of the witnesses in this case uh, were very cooperative. I mean, we had uh, one of the most challenging parts of this case was the logistics of making sure the witnesses were going to be available, make sure we could fly them all in because many of them had moved away or left law enforcement in the interim. And there was a huge amount of support uh, by by all almost all of the people involved. So, yeah, I think we're all going to take away something from this case. Uh, it really was uh, fascinating to watch. So, gentlemen, uh, Mr. Brian Sarabia, Mr. Chris Labruzzo, thank you so much for joining us here on the Law and Crime Network. And uh, again, congratulations. Thank, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Stephanie. Yeah. That was pretty incredible. It uh, was. It know. was great. I, I really love that we had the opportunity to speak with them. It brought a lot of things to light that maybe we wouldn't have been able to consider if we hadn't been able to speak to them. What do you think? I think it's uh, it, it's interesting that they, they said the challenges of this case because from our perspective, it seemed like a slam dunk. Right. But at the end of the day, it's never easy prosecuting a case, um, especially when, um, you know, it, it, it was all based upon a lot of the actions of the defendant after he, he was in the house and right. ordering the pizza. So it really was a fascinating case to watch. And in the end of the day, as I said, it's very difficult to get a unanimous jury verdict to impose death. But I, a man who will be now facing the rest of his life in prison for a brutal quadruple homicide, they, you know, you have to feel it's a success. Absolutely, I have to agree with you. I think that they did everything that they needed to do. We, we know that it was a circumstantial evidence case, but um, they, they really laid out those breadcrumbs. I, I think they crossed every T and dotted every I uh, just to make sure that they would be in the right place just to um, obtain some justice for the victim's family. So I, I believe that they did an amazing job here. Ab so. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, Stephanie, we're going to talk